Everyone knows the types. Those nerdy audio files with their audio cables, allegedly crafted from elven pubic hair, forged under a full moon by dwarves in Mount Doom. Often they come with a price tag surpassing that of the rest of the audio system. The claim they make is that using one of those special cables will improve the audio considerably. But how and why? And is there any truth to this? And is such a cable even worth it? Now in this video I want to tell you all about that. Well, hello there everyone and welcome to another video here on Anton's Hardware. Today's subject is cables. Walk into any electronic store and you'll be bombarded with a plethora of options, ranging from the budget-friendly to the eye-wateringly expensive. From USB cables claiming to improve audio to 3.5mm cables claiming to eliminate EMI completely. But what exactly sets them apart and on what basis do they make these claims? Now, at their core, every cable serves a sim simple purpose to transmit an electronic signal from its source to a receiver, allowing us to enjoy audio, use the internet, turn on a battery charger. Uh, it really doesn't matter if it's a digital or an analog signal. It's just an electronic pulse that is coded and can be interpreted. And what you want to achieve is that this pulse is received under optimal conditions without as little loss, deformation and degradation as possible. Any interference along the way must be eliminated because the biggest enemy in this chain is loss in the signal. Now, this interference or contamination of the signal has several origins. The elven pubic hair at the beginning, no, no, that was just a joke. Uh, rather, the material that the cable is ma made of can inhibit a correct transmission of a signal. Materials with a higher resistance aren't what you want. You want the signal to flow from A to B without any hindrance. Aluminum or aluminium has relatively low resistance and is cheap, making this the logical choice in most cables. But that is only in fourth place. The third place is gold, second is copper, and the first place is silver. Now, this is also the reason why higher endish cables are often more expensive. They tend to use more precious metals like copper, gold, and silver. Now that the signal is sent from A to B with the least amount of resistance, you don't want this signal to become contaminated by other signals. When sending an electronic signal, there will always be a magnetic field generated. Not a big one, but it is there. Now this magnetic field will have an influence on other signals on other cables and vice versa. Now back in the olden days, you could hear this when moving your mouse and you could actually hear a hum. And this is also the reason why I started this channel. I had an annoying hum and wanted to get rid of it. Well, hello there everyone. Here is my first video for Anton's hardware channel. Uh, back to the cables. So what you want is for as little as possible of the EMI to have an influence on the signal. Now this is usually done by shielding. In cables this is done with a thin metallic sheet surrounding all the wires. The better the shielding, the less of a crossover in the signal. But this will also make the cables more expensive, because the increase of manufacturing costs and also the increase of materials used. So now that we have the signals getting from A to B with the least amount of resistance and the least amount of interference, there's also the signal itself, because it's either an analog signal, like cables used in wired headsets, or a digital signal in USB signals. A digital signal has two methods of error corrections, the CRC checking and the PID or packet identifier to ensure that the correct packet is set in sequence. An analog signal has no error correction. When a digital signal has too many errors that the CRC and the PID can't correct, you will hear this as some loud and usually short burst static. In an analog signal, you will hear this as a hum or maybe some frequencies are not or incorrectly played. And that is why a USB cable will suffer less from a poor quality cable than an analog one, where the impact will have a direct impact. Now, those nerdy people I talked about will un undoubtedly disagree with me and state that the quality of the cable will have an impact. 
but we'll see that in the test results whether or not this is true. In order to set the record straight, I did some testing. I got myself some cables. Um, I could have used some, well, lower end cables like the ones everyone uses and some higher endish. Now, hear me using the word higher endish because I said in the introduction, you can go mental with the prices reaching ridiculous levels, but that's not the case here. For the high fi ish cables, I got these from AudioQuest. Yes, that's the company that also gave us the excellent Dragonflies. They use USB digital to analog converse with an amazing ESS Sabre with the black, the red and the cobalt. But also the company that gave us the mystifying jitterbug. The little USB thingy that was supposed to have a positive influence on the audio signal. But I found that it actually made it worse. So let's take a closer look at the boxes and the claims being made. First up is the tower, a 3.5mm to 3.5mm cable that's 1 meter long. It has a long grain copper, which is better from, for resistance. It has asymmetrical double balanced geometry, which basically means that the cables aren't constructed in a way that there isn't such a big EMI influence on each other. And to improve on that, there is also a metal layer noise dissipation system, which is just a metallic sheet to eliminate the external EMI. On the back, you can also see a picture of how this picture of this cable is made. And then we have the USB cable, a USB-C plug, two USB-C plug of just three quarters of a meter long. Again, a more precious metal is used, silver. Some foam is used to keep the cables from breaking when bending, and it's gold plated to again improve conductivity. The back of the box also has a diagram of how the cable is constructed. Also, on the bottom you can see that the more expensive cables have higher percentages of silver used. For testing purposes I used the Sheet Hell, a gaming deck made by the company Sheet. A gaming deck also has the excellent ESS Sabre and was recommended by me, although I wasn't overly enthusiastic, I must add. Overall, the Hell 2E is a definite improvement over the Fula, which I didn't like that much. In my opinion, the Hell 2E is worth its money, even when you buy it from Sheet Europe. I heard definite improvements over the Fula and in general, and Rightmark Audio and Lysro supports that. So why choose the Hell? Well, it's not overly hi-fi-ish like the Burson Audio Playmate 2, and at the same time, it isn't a lo-fi product. It represents something you may have at home and therefore more closer to a real-life situation. The fact that it has a USB-C connector also helps me with choosing. And now, the whole point of this video, the results Rightmark Audio Analyzer gave. First, the USB cable. Will the more expensive AudioQuest Forest have an impact on the audio quality? Now, in order to find out, I did every test three times and I used the best scores that I got to create this overview. Overall, there is a slight improvement in the audio quality when using the Forest. The frequency response is ever so slightly better, as is the noise level, the dynamic range, the intermodal distortion plus noise. The stereo crosstalk is ever so slightly worse. And what about the 3.5mm cable? Is there any difference there? Now here you can see some real improvement. On every front, everything is improved. The frequency response may be about the same, but the noise level, level is definitely improved. As is the dynamic range. The total harmonic distortion has doubled in quality, as did the intermodal distortion plus noise. Even a notoriously hard to beat stereo crosstalk has improved considerably. So overall you can see a definite improvement when testing better cables with Rightmark Audio Analyzer. With the USB cable this improvement is quite small, but with the 3.5mm cables there is a clear improvement. So what about actual listening? I mean, spending money on expensive cables and then not hearing any difference is kind of silly. 
To ensure that I heard it correctly, I asked the wife to do some blind switching to hear if there was any difference. So after some moping and groaning, she reluctantly helped. And the difference that I heard was minute, but it was there. It felt more accurate, with, with instruments better placed on the soundstage. It was as if the hell was more in control and there were less distractions going on. It made listening easier. In preparation of this video, I also read several articles from fellow reviewers and so many of them say that the difference is immense. I even read some reviewer claiming that he thought that was a whole new audio system. Maybe he should have his rear hearing checked because for me that just wasn't the case. Yes, there was an improvement, but nowhere near so much as to claim that it was a whole new audio system. So for my conclusions, you could go two ways with this. The glass is either half full or half empty. So you got to say either, well, you only paid 130 euros for two cables and you can hear what kind of improvement you got there. Imagine what kind of improvement you will get from getting more expensive cables. Or you could say, yes, you can see some improvement, but for 130 euros, it's a really minute improvement. Now I'm with the half full club, especially when you buy more expensive equipment, it's always wise to invest in cables. It's like getting a new nice car and then putting on some bicycle wheels under it. Yes, it may work and yes, you may move, but you won't use the car's full potential. And in my opinion, that's the same with audio cables. Do you want to use it for its full potential or not? The choice is yours. And with this ending, I would like to thank you for making it all the way to the end of this video. And I would like to see you in the next one. See you then. Bye-bye.